Greetings and welcome to another installment of City Lights Live. I am your host, Peter Maravellis. On Monday, March the 4th, 2024, City Lights, in conjunction with the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at UC Berkeley as part of the Brazilian Writer in Residency Program, also the affiliated faculty of the Program in Critical Theory at UC Berkeley and Verso Books, presented the award-winning writer Itamar Vieira Jr. in conversation with Johnny Lorenz. We celebrated the publication of Crooked Plow, also known as Torto Arado by Itamar Vieira Jr., published by Verso Books. Heralded as one of the most important Brazilian writers, Itamar Vieira Jr. is the winner of Portugal's prestigious Leia Jabuti, as well as Oceanos Prizes. He is the author of the short story collection, The Executioner's Prayer, and his second novel, Salvar o Fogo, was recently published. Itamar Vieira Jr., was joined in conversation by his translator, Johnny Lorenz, the poet, literary critic, and professor of English at Montclair State University. The conversation was moderated by Nathaniel Wolfson, assistant professor in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese and affiliated faculty of the Program in Critical Theory at the University of California at Berkeley. Professor Wolfson was the organizer of this event. We hope you enjoy it as much as we have. You've been roaming all over Agua Negra, through woods and marshes, along rivers, across every acre of the plantation, trying to identify and commit to memory each single tree. Your knowledge of those trails and paths has formed a precise map in your mind. You needed to become familiar with every slope, every ditch, that had been filled in or left open, every movement of the landscape, every departure and every arrival, every captive animal, every animal that was wild. You'd leave in the early morning and lose yourself exploring each nook and cranny of the forest. You'd return filthy, exhausted, your clothes increasingly tattered. No one ever asked where you'd been, what for. They knew you wouldn't respond. And the sounds, the sounds of animals, of rustling leaves, of flowing water, those sounds kept reverberating inside of you during your daytime duties, during your light sleep at night. You felt that the sounds of the world had always been your voice. Thank you. Muito obrigado. Um, vou fazer uma pergunta para começar e depois a gente pode abrir. Um, obrigado pelas leituras. Uh, a pergunta é sobre o ouvido. E também esse livro é, um, é um, também projeto, um produto de pesquisa e de ouvido e um, também um projeto etnográfico também, um, pode dizer. E queria saber um pouco sobre esse, essa experiência de, de ouvir e de falar com pessoas e como o ouvido um, surge no romance como um, um tema importante para você. So, uh, the question is about listening. Um, the, the, this book is in, in many ways also a product of research and listening to people and in certain ways an ethnographic project. And so I was, the question is a general question about listening and that experience of listening to people and how listening and hearing is, is an important theme and topic in the novel. Vamos ver se eu consigo responder. <laughs> um, o, esse romance, ele tem uma, uma relação, é, diria, profunda com um trabalho de pesquisa que eu desenvolvi no doutorado. Uh, mas eu, eu, eu penso sempre que a, a etnografia, o trabalho etnográfico, ele, bom, ele esteve a serviço da literatura e não o contrário. É, mas ainda assim a, é uma história que é, é permeada de referências à realidade, ao mundo, 
né, tal e qual, as nossas é, mazelas sociais, desigualdades, mas é, é, eu não abri mão da, do poder da imaginação, da ficção, para reelaborar toda essa realidade e tornar um, um trabalho literário. É, é, vamos Você dizer assim. Sim. Sim. Ah, <risos> um, uh, So, so the, this, this book is in part the fruit of research that he did as an ethnographer as part of his, his dissertation. Um, and, um, but he understands that the research that he was doing was um, in this book, you know, at, at the service of the fiction that he's trying to create. And so uh, he wants to kind of emphasize that as much as uh, um, the research that he did um, really tries to capture um, everything that he was learning about these communities in the interior of Bahia, um, that uh, uh, at the same time, um, you know, he, he sort of wants to emphasize that this is also a, a work of the imagination um, and um, that, that, that I sort of catch all that. Okay. Yeah, I think. <laughs> vou pedir desculpa, Milena, que eu vou repetir uma coisa que eu disse <laughs> na aula mais cedo. Um, é que para mim a literatura ela ela precisa de alguma maneira eu preciso aproximá-la da vida penso e, e acho que na nesse nesse vamos dizer nesse projeto literário uh, eu sempre vou depender da do mundo à minha volta né dessa capacidade é, de observar essa capacidade também de evocar a memória, mas, sobretudo, a, de é, mergulhar na imaginação para unir tudo aquilo que num, no dia a dia, no cotidiano, possa é, surgir, aparecer sem, sem o devido brilho, uh, sem a devida luz, mas que só a ficção pode pode iluminar, né? Uhum. Espero não ter dificultado a sua não. vida. Né? Mentira. <risos> o, o... <risos> ah, agora não, né? Agora, ah, desculpa, mas... <risos> um, so, um, he, you know, he believes that um, for him, literature is something that should stay close to, to daily life and to life as it is lived. And so, um, one of the... the uh, he he would say that one of the things that he focuses on as a writer is the sort of ability to observe and, and to study. And so that um, there's so much about daily life, just just the things that, that are part of the sort of the, the fabric of daily life that only literature can really capture uh, in terms of its like power and its majesty. Um, but it's really just part of sort of watching how people live their lives. Um, I think that's close to what he said. <laughs> Maybe just one follow-up to that um, for Johnny, um, a, a good, the question of listening as well. Mm -hmm. We spoke about this earlier a little bit, but just your experience, how how you maybe as a translator think about mm -hmm. that word and the process of listening to these, to mm -hmm. these words and... Um, and engaging with a kind of listening, which maybe is different, mm -hmm. has to do with listening in your exchange with one another as well? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so, uh, so I'll say two things about, about listening and how it maybe affect, affects my work as a translator of this book and understanding that another translator would have, you know, perhaps different concerns at the front of her or his mind or their mind. Um, but uh, so one thing that I was thinking about a lot is that I really wanted it to sound in English like someone was telling you a story because there's an, an immediacy, I think, to the voices. We have three storytellers in the book, so three first-person narrations. And um, I didn't want to lose the immediacy because I think people really respond to the way the book... Dá para entender o que estou dizendo? The way the, 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 the power, I think, of a lot of the book is so much in the, this feeling that um, these women or these feminine um, figures um, are, uh, because one of them, I'm not sure I can say she's a woman, but entities, <laughs> um, there's an immediacy 
about the way that they're speaking to you. And in this, and even in this, this um, Dreshu that we just read, this uh, section that we just read, uh, there's a voice speaking directly to one of the characters, one of the previous characters, which is sort of an interesting move to have. It's almost as though the book is talking to itself in a way. And so, so much of the book has this, I think, power of the, the word spoken in the moment that you're hearing it. And a lot of times my, my revision process was actually trying to make sure that it, it moved with the kind of fluidity and the, and the kind of immediacy that the poetry of the book isn't a poetry that gets you, um, um, it doesn't slow you down and entangle you. It moves a little bit like water, you know, it's a very, it's very, it's very mysterious, but there's a clarity and a, and a, and a speed to it. I didn't want to lose that the way that when a storyteller is trying to keep you engaged. The other thing I would say is that there are a lot of words in the Portuguese language where I sort of had to make a decision about when to keep it in the Portuguese language and when to translate it. And I know that that's also something that people could disagree about. And I guess my, my North star was that um, when it really benefited to have the word in English, then I, I would go for the English, but there are times when, so those of you who know the book, you know that there are some pages where um, it's almost it's almost like Itamar becomes like an ornithologist or something. Like there's just all these local birds of of the Chapa de Diamantina, like fluttering around the pages. And what would be the point of like giving all of their sort of like English names that are approximations or they sound very like science textbooky or something? The 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 pleasure of it is hearing like some of the names of the fruits, some of the names of the birds, some of the names of the fish. Sometimes they'd come into English, but sometimes you want to hear the, the musicality, you know, of, of the Portuguese. And so sometimes that's just about someone's ear and your idiosyncrasies as a, as a writer, as a translator, like when, when do you let it stay in the original Portuguese and when do you feel like the English is necessary? And that I think it's a hard thing to explain. It's just a little bit about like, the music, the timing, the 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 movement of the the syntax. Um, so I hope that kind of speaks to some of your question. Thank you so much. Yeah. I have lots of questions, but I'd love to open it up to the audience if there are any questions. Yes, Natalia. Oh, sure. Oh. Mm -hmm. Thank you, both um, Itamar and Johnny, for being here. And Nathaniel, thank you for organizing. Um, I'm going to ask a question in English. Um, maybe you can, just for the audience, and you can translate for Itamar. Itamar, I wondered if you could talk about what were the literary voices that you listened to or had with you? Because you've spoken about, you know, and as we read the book, that space becomes alive, not only you know, through the stories, but also through things like all these words of the things that inhabit that space. But the, the novel opens with a, a quote from Raduan Nassar as your epigraph, right? On the one hand, and on the other hand, there is a, a, a novel that kind of marks 20th century Brazilian literature, which is also so much about listening. And it's not the specifically same space, but related in some sense, and that's Guimarães Rosas and Grande Sertão Veredas, right? And so I was wondering if you could talk either about those or what, what were the literary voices that were with you in the writing? Pergunta tem a ver, vou parafrasear, mas tem a ver com as as escritores, as fontes literárias que você se escutou, você teve como referência na do ar, você cita no início do livro, um, mas a gente pode pensar no outro escritor muito importante no, uh, no século XX, Guimarães Rosa, que também um, uh, pode ser uma referência muito importante. Um, estou, estou, estou perdendo algumas coisas, desculpe, mas basicamente isso. Eu acho que a literatura, uh, a literatura brasileira é certamente foi uma grande fonte de é, 
de, não diria de inspiração, mas também é, de me situar, a, de encontrar uma voz, né? de, uma voz literária que desse conta dessa realidade. É, talvez não repetir o que já foi feito, mas entender o percurso desses autores para encontrar sua própria voz. Né? É, muita gente, por exemplo... Hum, e por isso que eu acho que tem uma ligação com a pergunta anterior de pensar a, a etnografia, a antropologia a serviço da literatura e não o contrário, porque o resultado seria diferente. É, mas muito, muitas pessoas falam, por exemplo, uh, sobre a, a... Falar de Grande Sertão Veredas, que eu acho que é o, é o grande romance né, brasileiro do século XX. E como o Guimarães ele, ele cria uma linguagem é, absolutamente literária para dar conta de uma realidade, de uma, de uma dimensão de vida, né? de um, sem, sem perder, a, sem descaracterizar tanto aquilo que está sendo retratado, embora não seja a linguagem das pessoas e tudo. É, é claro que eu me pus no lugar de humildade, é, <risos> Eu não seria capaz de, de, de criar um mundo tão, tão fabuloso, né? uma linguagem tão quase mística que, que o Guimarães cria em Grande Sertão Vereda, mas, Veredas, mas ainda assim acho que eu fui guiado por, esse, por saber que eu contaria essa história encontrando a minha voz, a, a, a própria voz, que é, é o meu pacto, Desculpe, quem não, vai traduzir? Não tem. É, depois eu lembro que alguém tem que traduzir. <risos> Ai, já foi. Ah, essa voz é o, é o meu pacto, é minha oferta para o leitor e é o meu convite também para que ele adentre aquele universo. Né? Eu poderia convidá-lo de inúmeras maneiras, mas esta foi a maneira que eu encontrei. E aí eu acho que entender como cada um deles seja o Raduan, que eu cito na epígrafe, seja o Guimarães Rosa ou os outros, o Graciliano Ramos, que para mim é uma grande referência, um, até a poesia do João Cabral de Melo Neto, para mim é uma referência importante também, como cada um seguiu o, o seu caminho para encontrar a sua voz e como seria isso seria para mim, né? se isso seria possível também. Uhum. Uh, faz um briefing. <laughs> oh. I said I would do this, well, but the translator has to. Yeah, no, no, it's, 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 it's fine. <laughs> well, um, okay. It might not happen in chronological order. Um, I'm gonna, um, but I'm gonna mention the fact that uh, four writers were mentioned. So um, the the book begins with an epigraph from Hadwan Nasar, um, uh, who whose novel you can find as well in English. Um, it's translated as ancient tillage in English, Lavora Caica, um, is the epigraph. Um, Gimenez Rosa, um, believe it or not, for those of you who are Brazilian, Grande uh, Sertão, uh, 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 Veredas is going to eventually come out in English. The poor translator <laughs> is, is still tearing her hair out, I think, uh, but, I think this has been a lifelong project of hers, so it's, that's going to come out. And um, the other two writers that were mentioned were, uh, I'm Ramos. sorry, Gracilia uh, Ramos and João Cabral de Melo Neto. Um, Gracilia uh, Ramos, um, actually, Vidas Secas was translated, but I think it's out of print in English. So I'm doing like the translator thing. I'm interested in like telling those of you who are interested in Brazilian, you know, but it should really come out again maybe with a new translation, but don't look at me. Uh, <laughs> and, it, and it's called Barren Lives in English. Uh, Barren Lives, the translation that I'm, that I'm familiar with. Juan Cabral de Melo Neto has been translated actually a number of times into English. Um, and perhaps the, the, um, maybe the most famous translation would be Richard Zenas translation. Uh, there's a volume called Education by Stone. For those of you who are interested, it's actually a bilingual uh, edition. So it's very, it's very nice to have both languages. Um, And Morch yeah, Morch yeah, it doesn't have any poems from Morchi Vida Severina, but um, and that, but that's Jean Cabral de Melo Neto. These are all writers who have a very strong identification with the land, 
and with this particular, more or less this region of Brazil, um, the Northeast of Brazil. And so I think that's why uh, this conversation is sort of going towards those four writers because um, each in their own way, and, and, and Tamar was speaking to this question, and each, each in their own way have, have a way of trying to understand how their language could somehow capture something about um, a relationship to this particular landscape, um, especially because in some of these texts, the land is particularly, um, people don't know this kind of tradition in Brazilian literature, this landscape can be particularly unforgiving. And so it gives rise to this almost kind of mythical um, environment of like of, of what some people call the backlands. Um, and it also a little bit like the American sort of badlands where there's a kind of, you know, they're, they're, they're bandits and there's sort of like a, you know, the idea of like a region sort of like outside of the law and, and you got to like, you got to have like a sacred mission just to survive the, the brutality of daily life. And so Itamar was kind of saying, you know, uh, I'm not trying to, to imitate these, these, these references, but everyone in there, you know, with, with, I think you said with, with humility, I'm trying to find like, you know, invent my own voice um, because someone like Ibn Ayn's Haza has a um, almost um, mythical, mystical, can't remember which of those two words he used, right? Um, that, that is sort of, um, a, a, it's, it's, such, it's such a famous voice, you know, but, but it's, it's not necessarily a one that Itamar was interested in sort of like imitating because it's a, sort of its own thing. And he's trying, uh, I think this goes back to his previous um, discussion, and I'm not sure I said it quite so well before, but I think this goes back to the idea of listening to, to the people who are living um, on, that, on that land, from that land, and trying to find his own voice, navigating, you know, capturing that. Um, I probably missed some stuff in there, but um, <laughs> I, think, I think it's more or less faithful to what yeah. you said. <laughs> and I think that Pause has this absolutely literary voice i think you said mm -hmm. maybe and yeah yeah yeah. The, yeah maybe a point of of distinction there yeah. um mm -hmm. thank you so much yeah. Yeah, yeah more questions i also have another well, there's a question here in the front we were kind of in the front Obrigada. Bom, eu vou fazer a minha pergunta em português. Um, bom, estou com muita vontade de ler o livro e não, não uh, li ainda, mas gostei o que você leu e você leu também. Uh, minha pergunta, eu, eu tenho curiosidade sobre o fato que todos os personagens são mulheres ou são feminino, femininos, né? Femininas. E... Um, Eu gostaria de saber se você acostuma escrever de voz feminina ou é diferente é, é a primeira vez ou é uma nova uh, propósito com este livro? We'll translate. Um, the, um, the question, um, uh, you're very interested in reading the novel. You have not read it yet, but you're excited. And... Um, you're interested in the the presence of feminine voices in the novel. Characters are um, many of the important characters are female, and so if if this is something that you have um, continuously done in your work, um, and to tell us a little bit about that uh, presence. Bom, eu já escrevi algumas coisas, uh, e eu, eu vez ou outra eu volto para esse lugar da, das personagens, né, de, de imaginar as personagens e trazer essas personagens femininas para para o primeiro plano. Ah, eu já me perguntei muitas vezes, né, por que isso? Ah, talvez tenha sido uma experiência, essa experiência pessoal eh, de conviver com mulheres, com muitas mulheres, ah, ter atenção para para o mundo, para o universo delas, né? Eu estou pensando nas mães, nas tias, nas pessoas próximas, nas mulheres da comunidade. É... E também, tal... acho que tem uma relação com minha atenção para o mundo à minha volta, né? A, a literatura, é... bom, acho que é um espaço que durante muito tempo é... 
tanto foi escrita por homens, continua sendo escrita por homens, né? É, claro, cada vez mais mulheres ocupando esse espaço, um espaço que, que não é, é... que é desigual por conta do, da, da estrutura... É, da estrutura desigual mesmo, né? Do, uh, e eu queria que essa história espelhasse a realidade e no, no meu percurso como e aí trabalhando no campo eu encontrei mulheres em posição de liderança mas eu sempre digo lá estão os personagens homens né e são personagens importantes é, no, no caso de Tortuarado por exemplo temos um personagem que é uma liderança natural é, que é uma liderança espiritual e política no começo que é o Zeca Chapéu Grande então é, isso mostra uma, uma, um, um movimento geracional, né? Ele é o, o homem, ele é o, a liderança, depois chega o Severo e breve, por um breve tempo ele se torna essa liderança e depois, na ausência dos dois, as mulheres assumem é, esse lugar de liderança. Claro que a história de antemão já coloca elas numa posição de protagonismo. Mas uh, por que contar essa história por mulheres? Uh, eu acho que é, é muito interessante, eu sou muito observador e eu vejo que no Brasil uh, não é diferente de muitos outros lugares, mas nos espaços institucionais, nos espaços de poder, as mulheres ainda é, são minoria, né? Elas, elas estão numa posição de minoria. E Aí eu vou dar um exemplo. O Supremo Tribunal Federal, que é uma co a corte, né? a Suprema Corte, é, tem apenas uma juíza, uma ministra, é, e dentre 11 ministros, é apenas uma mulher agora. Já foram duas, agora é apenas uma. E, de uma maneira paradoxal, nos espaços é, populares, nos espaços é, dos camponeses ou mesmo das, das comunidades urbanas e periféricas, as mulheres têm um papel de liderança muito mais proeminente. E eu acho uh, que isso indica alguma mudança que, que, que está em curso. As mulheres nas classes populares está, estarem, é, pelas circunstâncias, assumindo esse espaço de liderança de, de, de relativo poder, porque elas são dentro da estrutura, mas isso indica que algo está mudando, né? E eu queria retratar essa essa mudança com essa história, já que é uma história que atravessa algumas gerações, elas naturalmente é, ocupam esse espaço, a história começa com elas, mas já indica, eu já sabia de antemão, que em algum momento elas ocupariam esse espaço de liderança. Então... É, e a literatura é esse terreno da liberdade, onde a gente pode ser qualquer coisa. As, eu, posso, eu posso narrar como um espírito, como, como existe na história. E se eu dissesse que era uma árvore narrando, ali há um pacto meu e do leitor que, que aquilo faz sentido naquela história. É, e esse, é esse lugar onde a gente pode experimentar ser o outro. Né? Até quando lemos, nós experimentamos ser o outro, né? ser homem ou mulher, ser a personagem homem ou mulher, não importa. A gente quer viver o, quer viver a vida do outro. E escrever não é muito diferente de ler, né? Nem nem ria, Johnny. É, eu sei que ele... Você vai fazer um apanhado. Eu vou começar a inventar coisas, assim, só para sentido, né? Será que ele faz isso com tradução? He was... Também... He was just going on and on about, about how great the translator's work uh, was. And um, dá para ver, né? Como, como o tradutor é uma figura maltratada. Será que quando ele está cansado okay. de traduzir, Sim, aí, ele, aí ele fala, ah, agora eu vou escrever assim da minha cabeça mesmo. All right. I'm gonna Já conheço a história. I'm going to try to hold on to four, four different responses to your question i'm going to blame you it's your fault because you asked the question um okay so so um so the question about the 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 women speakers the female speakers so one is that um well first of all i thought it was kind of interesting that he sort of like i ask myself the same question you know so 
Well, I'm just, so I'm going to say that he said a bunch of stuff afterwards, but it still, it still seems like he's trying to figure that out, right? Like, so it's kind of interesting, né? É uma, uma pergunta aberta ainda. Você até tem, assim... What was yeah, uma, uma pergunta, pergunta, bom, okay, I want to, okay, I'm sorry, I'm getting this, <laughs> we'll, start, we'll start talking to each other. Um, um, my, okay, so one, um, one, one of the things he wanted to say was that he's, he, in his own life, he was surrounded by, by women and, and their storytelling and their, right, and their voices. And so in a lot of ways, his work is informed by, by that. Another thing that he wanted to say is that, um, and I'm sorry, I'm giving like this sort of the, the shorter version here, but um, that uh, in in Brazilian society, um, women often don't occupy positions of power. And he gave the, 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 the example of the their version of the Supreme Court, where there's one, just one woman sitting on, the, on that court. But he notices that in more um, popular, by which I mean, like of the people, like in more sort of like, you know, the way power operates in in day to day life, women often have very like important, powerful roles, and it's not always reflected in some of like the hierarchies of power that are that are more official or more authoritative. Um, and so you can see this sometimes in you know in the way that uh, the culture operates that women actually have very powerful positions. But he, so he, in some ways, he wanted to honor that. Um, Another thing that you said, wait, I missed, I missed number two in there and the voices and huh? Dun, 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 dun. Um, I know I'm missing something. I know that I know there is something about, I, I can, okay, I'll, I'll come back to it, but there was something about also that literature is, this is the fourth thing, but I know I missed something in there in the middle. That literature is the, is the space of freedom. And so you can be anyone you want to be. And so, um, uh, so, so he wanted to sort of like emphasize that, you know, uh, if I, if my story needs, needs a particular voice, literature offers you an opportunity to be, let's say, you know, uh, a woman in a particular chapter, or perhaps a spiritual entity in another chapter. And that, um, literature is a space of freedom. Um, so I think, I think I got most of that. Did I miss something important? Mm -hmm. yeah yes right 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 yeah and so there's a yeah so he was saying of course a lot of men get published and a lot of men are our writers are getting published and a lot of their heroes and and leaders are tend to be masculine and so you know kind of got that covered right so this is like a space of like trying to open it up to to hear the ways in which women do actually occupy these very and, and we know also i mean you didn't say this but we know that in like a lot of the religious tradition in Salvador and like the, the, the candomblé, mm -hmm. the, 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 the women, women often have, uh, as mulheres têm um papel assim de, de poder, de, de autoridade de forte. Yeah, there was so, a comparison, the Supreme Court, right, has yeah. um, only one woman on it right now. Yeah. And then the comparison was also when he was traveling in the Diamantina region, he encountered mm -hmm. many women leaders, right? right so that right, kind of... right. I yeah, and in, in, in the book, you actually have two men who are sort of like leaders of, one is a spiritual leader, Zeca Chapel Grande, which li, for those of you who aren't speak Portuguese, literally means like big-hatted Zeca. <laughs> Zeca Chapel Grande. And there's a whole story just about that nickname, which you only find, like so much of the book, what's so great about it is that there are all these things sort of like dropped in and you really just have to be patient because all will be revealed he just <laughs> it unfolds you know there's a whole story there and it's actually a very beautiful um sort of mini story that, as this book is it's sort of a lot of sort of stories within stories um then there's the labor leader severo um but i don't want to give too much away but certain things happen where a, a woman has to kind of step up and become the sort of like the militant leader of of a cause and and that and and, and that happens in the book so um, but he says that's not very different from what he what he found when he went to these these small towns in the in the interior, uh, women taking on these very powerful um, roles of of leadership. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
Now, just to remember that he finished by saying that read, writing is somehow like uh, reading, no? And so this really... Uh, então, eu queria até começar falando isso. Bom, mas, é, e tem uma, bom, antes de mais nada, super parabéns pelo seu livro, é incrível. Eu, eu gostei muito, fiquei muito emocionada quando eu li esse, esse seu, é, seu livro. E também parabéns por ele estar publicado em inglês, porque é muito bom a gente chegar a novos públicos, né? Porque não é nem mercados, porque isso é outra coisa, mas é mesmo a ideia do público, né? Da cultura brasileira também, da, das grandes mãos chegarem em outros, em outros lugares. Então, parabéns por isso também. Quando eu li seu livro, eu fiquei tão emocionada, e eu tenho um, um hábito de, de sair emprestando ou dando os livros que eu gosto muito. E no seu caso, como eu sou baiana também, né, eu terminei dando para umas mulheres que, da minha família ou amigas que são muito diferentes entre si. Gente lá da região de Jacobina, mulheres que não leem, ou que leem muito pouco, tias minhas, eu o direcer, mas também amigas minhas com uma formação muito, muito alta né, de Salvador. E, e todas elas ficaram muito emocionadas e tiveram é, experiências muito próximas, né, de, é, é, de, de é, prim, primeiro de, de ligação com determinados, é, determinados personagens, determinadas personagens, mas também algumas situações, né, algumas situações de dor, algumas situações é, de esperança ou de falta de esperança, ou algumas situações de construção de identidade, de saber depois, de olhar para trás e falar, caramba, eu era assim, será que eu era... E aí eu fiquei me perguntando muito, assim, em seu livro, eu queria lhe fazer essa pergunta, ainda bem que eu tenho essa oportunidade, que é, você pensou em quem lia? Assim, quem lia? Era um sujeito, uma sujeita para ti, assim, tinha isso ou não tinha? É, e, e aí, pronto, essa era a minha pergunta, mas depois que você disse que escrever é como ler, Aí eu quero saber esse segredo aí. <risos> Obrigada. Eu posso, se quiser. Ok. The question was, uh, was first... Viu como é que é? Já aprendeu com ele. Aprendeu com ele. I'm just going to say that, so, uh, her, her, her question was, was, um, was saying first that she just wanted to say that she was personally very moved by the book. And she would give the book to other people to read. And it was interesting that when she gave it to like women in her family, they, there are various degrees of education. And, and sometimes these are women who just didn't read as a, as, as a habit. And then there are other women who were highly sort of university educated in Salvador. And, and they all seemed to have just this very powerful, didn't matter. They all had these very powerful responses to the book. And so that in itself was interesting to her. And then she had a very specific question is, were you thinking of a, a very specific reader when you wrote the book? And, and if you did, what, who, who was that reader? Uh, os brasileiros são trabalho, né? Eu, eu tenho participado de eventos, sempre tem brasileiro, fo brasileiros fora do Brasil. Eu, eu me lembrei da Kisha, que é professora Kisha. E é, é, ela falou uma coisa assim, é, é, geralmente eles, os brasileiros, as perguntas são maiores, né? Eles, eles perguntam e eles mesmos respondem, né? <risos> É meio engraçado. The translation of that is as Brazilians are difficult. Is what kind of saying? And they'll even ask a question and then answer their own question. So. E bom, mas eu 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 penso que assim é é, é claro quando a gente escreve a gente tem um não um leitor ideal, mas tem um horizonte de leitores, né? Hoje eu tenho um, um horizonte ampliado de leitores, porque é, esse livro conquistou muitos leitores. Então, eu, eu, eu tenho... No, assim, eu sei uh, a, a que público pode chegar. Né? E eu acho que isso é, não determina, mas, de alguma maneira, é o nosso horizonte enquanto nós escrevemos. Mas, no caso de, de Tortuarado, não existia esse, esse horizonte de leitor. E eu escrevi essa história, eu sempre imaginava as pessoas à minha volta. 
as pessoas que, que, com que eu compartilhava experiências, anseios, né? é, histórias mesmo, e era, eram essas pessoas que estavam assim no meu horizonte, e era elas que eu me dirigia enquanto eu escrevia. Né? É, eu queria também, acho que isso é, isso estava muito claro para mim, que eu precisava escrever algo, é, eu, eu não, não precisava abdicar de um, de um projeto estético, vamos dizer assim, mas eu queria que fosse algo é, que não tivesse tantos artifícios, que fosse a, ao corpo da pessoa, ao coração de quem lê esse, sabe? Eu não queria que a minha linguagem é, é, fosse um, 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 algo que dificultasse a leitura de quem quer que fosse, é, quem, de quem quer que seja desse livro, né? De, de, pensando no leitor ideal, eu não queria que existissem esses artifícios para criar uma segregação de quem poderia ler e de quem não poderia ler. E eu acho isso é maravilhoso, porque eu vejo pessoas... É, e aí eu, eu fico satisfeito com o trabalho por pensar dessa maneira. Porque eu encontro, por exemplo, tem pessoas que, que me disseram já assim, ah, eu passei por um morador de rua em São Paulo e tinha um exemplar muito gasto assim do lado. Eu acho que ele estava lendo. Uma pessoa que dormia na rua. Ou então uma professora que disse assim, eu dei esse livro para auxiliar de limpeza da escola e ela, porque ela me viu lendo, perguntou o que era, eu dei para ela, e ela leu e mandava áudios para a professora, assim, de, falando da experiência dela sobre ler aquele livro, que ela lembrou das, da família, das pessoas, ou seja, é, eu acho isso, de fato, era o que estava no meu horizonte, que não fosse algo hermético, que tivesse um público muito específico, eu queria que fosse uma linguagem que fosse capaz de chegar a todos de uma maneira uh, de uma maneira simples e direta, né? Eu não sabia quem era esse público, mas eu tinha isso em mente enquanto eu escrevia, que eu queria que fosse algo simples e direto que que tivesse a capacidade de chegar a todas as pessoas. Sim. <risos> um... I think I can emphasize the, the, the latter part of what he said, because I think that's really where it gets to the, the question. Um, although he did say that, you know, now, now for him, like the, the reader that he's imagining now, it, the, you know, this book has, so for those of you who don't know, like in Brazil, the, the book has now reached 800,000 copies sold, which is like, you know, So I don't think he was, ex he was expecting that. So now as he's writing, you know, it's kind of like redefined a little bit, like what kind of readers are reading because now he's had this whole experience where this book is a bestseller and this, you know, all this stuff. But when he was writing Torturado, he said that he, you know, he really wanted the book to be something where sort of like the artifice of literary writing wouldn't be something that would actually be an obstacle for certain readers and that readers of all types would feel sort of like invited and engaged by by his what he's calling you know it's kind of a tricky way of describing he's calling it like very simple very clear language but i think we all if those of us who know the book know it's a very complex book but I, i think we can also say that there is something very clear and sort of in, immediately engaging about about the the language itself the complexity, he, he didn't say this, and there's me just saying, there's the complexity there. He's saying, and, you know, in some ways he's saying it's like a simple, it's simple language, but we know that it, it's a paradox in the book that I think it is very, de uma forma, a linguagem simples, mas do outro lado, tem uma complexidade, mas não é, é como o que, uh, so Neruda, Neruda said something about this when he wrote his, I don't know if they have, I know there's Neruda in here somewhere, but, When Neruda wrote his Odas Elementales, if people know Neruda's poetry, Neruda said he wanted to write poems because he, he went around Chile and he met people who were like working in the mines. And he was like, I wanted my poetry to be a book that they would read too, not just like the professors of literature. And he said a, a good poet should have comfortable shoes 
because a poet should be walking and talking to people. And I think this book is very much like this. It's a book that clearly it's someone who's gone around and literally has done this, gone around. Tá me entendendo o que eu tô dizendo? Que você tá ouvindo essas vozes, né? E não é só assim, você trancado, né? Tava escrevendo, tá me entendendo? Você tá ouvindo, yeah. né? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um, so he, he said it really was interesting to him that he, you know, people would say, Oh, you know, I loved your book so much, but it was, it was even sort of more interesting when, you know, someone would say, um, I saw like someone who's like sleeping on the street with a copy of Tortorado all like beat up and used, you know, like by the, by his side and that person was reading or someone else said, I read the book, but I gave it to I'm should I say like a custodian? Is that is that more like a custodian? Um, and to to see because she seemed interested in the book, and I gave her a copy, and then she like sent me like audio messages, like reading parts of the book, and then talking about how much her own life was like related to the book, and so uh, that gave him a particular kind of um, satisfaction. Um, how did yeah? Did I cover it? Okay, okay. Back. Okay. Oi, Tomar. Sou muito sua fã. Eu li seu livro tem uns dois anos e desde então fiquei apaixonada. Uh, I will ask in English because I, I think it's easy for everyone. And my, I have a question and I don't have an answer and I'm Brazilian, <laughs> but it's because I want to know how to how do you found your voice because we have the character voice we have a we have like everyone in the book have a voice a different voice but everyone have one voice it's your voice and we see this in other works in the um Dora Mai Yotseya, and it's the same voice. It's another character, it's another story, it's another word, but it's the same voice. As a writer, I am just just like, sometimes I'm looking all my books, I'm looking all the things that I have written, and I don't know where my voice is. And I really want to know how to find this voice and how can we work? How can we have like this, this uh, well done work with our own voice? Where we will find uh, what we, we can look, what we can read, uh, where we can go to find this voice. Ah. Ah. Sim. Ah, eu acho que a gente encontra a gente encontra a nossa voz é, nesse experimento permanente, né? Eu nunca sei qual é a voz de cada história. E eu começo a escrever a história e, eventualmente, a voz muda é, no percurso. E eu recomeço para seguir aquilo que, que parece fazer sentido, mais sentido para mim. Ah, ah, eu, eu tenho essa preocupação. Ah, eu acho que isso é algo que não veio, que não surgiu comigo, né? mas é de, é de pensar a literatura, de pensar a narrativa uh, literária a partir de múltiplas perspectivas. É, é algo, por exemplo, que o William Faulkner fez com, com brilhantismo, né? Acho até que inaugura, de alguma maneira, uma, uma narrativa mais abrangente que traz a vo as vozes das personagens. É, e mesmo sendo personagens distintas, é, com vozes distintas, Ainda assim, ali naquele... Uh, no conjunto, a gente sabe que há a voz do autor fazendo essa mediação né, de tudo. Então, eu tenho essa consciência, mas também tenho a preocupação de que essas, voz, essas vozes elas 
elas sejam autônomas, elas, elas carreguem sentido. É, eu tenho... Uh, é, geralmente eu descubro isso nas conversas com os tradutores, né? Porque essa insegurança eu acho que permeia o, o trabalho mesmo, uh, de alguma maneira. Mas aí quando eu converso com eles, quando eu vejo as dúvidas que eles trazem... Quando eu, é, aí eu percebo que elas, elas têm, é, são vozes autônomas, mas ainda assim, no meio de tudo aquilo, existe o meu trabalho, né? E eu não, eu não quis, é, eu acho que a gente não se anula, é, a gente não se apaga por trás das personagens. A costura da linguagem é, é o nosso trabalho, senão não faria sentido nem que a gente escrevesse, né? É, mas como encontrar essa voz? Isso é o, cada história pede essa voz, né? Cada história traz a, as suas necessidades. Eu acho que a gente precisa ter atenção e, e sobretudo, escutar mesmo, porque é escutando. Eu não estou falando escutando o mundo, a gente já escuta, né? A nossa volta. Mas escutando aquilo que a gente escreve, a gente vai encontrar o, o tom adequado para para a escrita, é escutando, reescrevendo, escutando de novo, aí a gente vai encontrar o tom. Que bom saber que você escreve e, e que está em busca disso também, né? Mas é, é, uma, é uma busca que não tem fim, que não termina, ainda bem, porque cada escrita é um desafio novo, né? Essa voz não é definitiva, cada trabalho exige uma voz Ah, que maravilha. <risos> que bom saber. Depois eu quero ler o que você escreveu. <risos> um, so she just said that it was it was this book that inspired her to uh, change her life, right? Because now she wants to be a writer. And um so so uh so one of the things he said is that someone like William Faulkner And probably we're thinking of a book like As I Lay Dying, if people know this book where, you know, you, you have a it's, a, it's a novel, but the novel is told through a variety of first person narrations, right? So it's all one story, but it's still told through different narrators. Mais ou menos esse livro que você estava pensando, As I Lay Dying. Eu pensei nesse, eu pensei, é que, que em português acho que ficou o título Enquanto Agoniza. Sim, é isso, é, As I Lay Dying, Enquanto é, Agoniza. Mas é o sonho, o, o sonho e a fúria. Sonho, o Stand and the Fury, é, yeah. Absalão, okay. Absalão. Absalão, Absalão, ok. So, um, so, clearly he knows the work of Faulkner, William Faulkner. Um, so, um, which is always also good to keep in mind because we were talking about this earlier that um, Brazilian writers read international fiction, and we were just talking about how, you know, I think it's like 3% of what gets published in this country is international, uh, 3%. In fact, there's a journal called 3% for that very reason, because they only publish international fiction. Um, but he was saying is that, you know, it, it's still William Faulkner's distinctive voice behind these different voices. And so that's actually like he was kind of saying it's it's interesting. It's also a kind of a problem because you're kind of like thinking about, well, but you're still it's still your voice, but it's these different, you know. But what he was kind of then saying is as a kind of way of thinking about it is that you don't like erase yourself when you invent these voices. It's still you and you're constructing these voices. Um, the important thing is to really, and this kind of goes back to what we talked where we began, right? Is that you write and you listen as you're writing and then you rewrite and you listen for the voice that the story needs I, well i think we have time for either one more question or reading another ex, uh, excerpt would you like to read another one or maybe we'll Is there, maybe we'll take I'm, the one question i'm okay with either tem preferência uma pergunta ou ler um, 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 um trecho curto? Ler, ok. Vamos, vamos okay. terminar com um trecho mais lindo. Tem um trecho, não é? We're going to just finish oh. with one more, with one more reading, and then we'll, we'll have a book signing opportunity. Oh. 
Ok, sim, sim, sim. Ok. Até o capítulo 8. Ok, ok. Ok. Okay. Good faith. Tony's going to begin and then eat a marble. Um, so for those of you who have who have this version, it's on page 129, what I'm going to read. And this is, um, maybe I don't say anything. Who's, who's speaking? If you know the book, okay, someone is speaking. <laughs> someone is, I'm trying to avoid spoilers, you know, so. Um, so on page 129, yeah, it's going to, I'm sorry, it's going to give it away. So Belonesia is speaking here and what, whatever you want to think that means, I'll let you just, okay, sorry, I should shut up now. Okay. Uh, time went by and eventually I decided to try to speak. I walked alone down the same path Donana liked to take. I still remember the word I chose for myself, plow. I enjoyed watching my father drive his old ox drawn plow tearing up the soil so that later he could toss rice into the red and brown clods of turned earth. I liked hearing the word plow enunciated. It's a strong, resonant word. I'm going to work with the plow today. I'm going to plow the land. A new plow would be nice. This one's old and beat up. But the sound that came from my mouth was an aberration chaotic, as if the severed chunk of my tongue had been replaced by a hard-boiled egg. My voice was a crooked plow, deformed, penetrating the soil only to leave it infertile, ravaged, destroyed. I tried other times alone to say that word aloud, and later other words as well, attempting to restore speech to my body, to become the Bellonesia I used to be. But in the end, I gave up. When the edema went away, I still couldn't reproduce a word that even I would recognize. I had no intention of making sounds that provoked my own grief and disgust, and I didn't want to be teased by the children at Fermina's school or by Tonya's daughters. For many years, only when I was alone, and even then, rarely, I'd attempt to speak. It was kind of torture I'd impose upon myself consciously, as if Donana's knife were running through me, shredding the strength I'd been cultivating, as if the plow, old and bent, were running through my insides, tearing me apart. All the courage I'd tried to instill in myself would drain away, the courage needed to live in that hostile land of perennial rain, Perennial sun and occasional rain. That abusive land where people were dying constantly, denied all succor, where we lived like cattle working and getting nothing in return, not even rest. And our sole rights were to reside on that land for as long as the owners were willing. And if we never, lift, never left Agua Negra to be buried in the grave awaiting us at Viração. But I persisted. On the paths I walked alone, I'd recite the most hideous words to myself, words no one would wish to hear. And over time, I did it more frequently. I wasn't shy of saying things that would have made others run away, frightened off by my tongue's virulence. I'd repeat those words in a strange, distorted voice, full of anger about so many things, an anger that only grew with time. And now, suffering my husband's abuse, the words became viler still. Words cried out by my ancestors, by my mother and grandmother, and the great-grandmothers I never knew. Words that came to me to be uttered in my horror of a voice. And thus, those words acquired the sad and enduring contours that would keep me alive. Passado muito tempo, resolvi tentar falar. 
porque estava sozinha me embriando na mesma vereda que Donana costumava entrar. Ainda recordo da palavra que escolhi, arado. Me deleitava vendo meu pai conduzindo o arado velho da fazenda carregado pelo boi, rasgando a terra para depois lançar grãos de arroz em torrões marrons e, e vermelhos revolvidos. Gostava do som redondo, fácil, ruidoso, que tinha ao ser enunciado. Vou trabalhar no arado, vou arar a terra. Seria bom ter um arado novo, esse arado está troncho e velho. O som que deixou minha boca era uma aberração, uma desordem, como se no lugar do pedaço perdido da língua tivesse um ovo quente. Era um arado torto, deformado, que penetrava a terra de tal forma a deixá-la infértil, destruída, dilacerada. Tentei outras vezes, sozinha, dizer a mesma palavra, e depois outras, tentar restituir a fala ao meu corpo para ser a Belonísia de antes, mas logo me vi impelida a desistir. Nem mesmo quando Edema se desfez, consegui reproduzir uma palavra que pudesse ser entendida por mim mesma. Não iria reproduzir os sons que me provocavam o des desgosto e repulsa e ser alvo de zombaria para as crianças na casa de Firmina ou para as filhas de Tonha. Durante todos esses anos, somente quando estava só e mesmo assim muito raramente, ousava dizer algo. Era o tipo de tortura que me impunha de forma consciente, como se a faca de Donana pudesse me percorrer por dentro, rasgando toda a força que tentei cultivar desde então. Como se o arado, velho e retorcido, percorresse minhas entranhas, lacerando minha carne. Se esvaía toda a coragem de que tentei me investir para viver naquela terra hostil de sol perene e chuva eventual de maus tratos, onde morria, onde gente morria sem assistência, onde vivíamos como gado, trabalhando sem ter nada em troca, nem mesmo descanso. E as únicas coisas a que tínhamos direito era morar lá até quando os senhores quisessem e a cova que nos esperava fosse cavada na viração, onde, caso não deixássemos água negra. Mas eu persistia e repetia as palavras mais duras, as que não gostamos de ouvir, para mim mesma, nos caminhos que percorria sozinha e que, com o passar do tempo, foram se tornando mais frequentes. Não me furtava dizer o que faria muitos correrem, temendo a virulência de uma língua. Eram palavras repetidas por minha voz deformada, estranha, carregada de rancor por muitas coisas e que só fez crescer ao longo dos anos. Agora, com os maus tratos de Tobias, elas se tornaram mais vis. Eram gritadas por minhas ancestrais, por Donana, por minha mãe, pelas avós que não conheci e que chegavam a mim para que as repetissem com horror de meus sonhos e assim ganhassem os contornos tristes e inesquecíveis que me manteriam viva. Thank you so much to both of you. This has been a pleasure. Thank you to everyone who came and uh, asked questions and participated. And now we can have some um, autographs. Thank you everyone for coming. <laughs>